How are we all today? I am so excited today to be catching up with Dr. Deb Levy. Now we are going to be talking about all things developmental milestones. Now it is a huge topic to unpack. We have probably about 30 minutes with Dr. Deb where we can talk through all of these um, amazing milestones and how to navigate it with your little one. Um, but we are certainly going to do our best to cover all of those important things. Now I'm just gonna add Dr. Deb, so just give me one moment. And I'll see if I can get her into the call. Uh, one second. I know that she'll be waiting to join us. All right. I've just sent you the invite, Dr. Deb. So hopefully we have time soon. Lovely to see your faces on here already, everyone. I know that developmental milestones. Hi, Eve. <laughs> developmental milestones is a huge topic because if you're anything like me, um, oh, here we go. Dr. Deb is joining us. I'm going to stop talking so that I can leave it all for when she is with us. I can't see yet, Dr. Deb. I've sent you a request, so just hit the accept. Let me try again. See if we can get you there, Dr. Deb. All right. Oh, here we go. We've already got a question. Oh, we've got so many. Here we go, Dr. Deb. I've got you here. Hopefully we can get you on. Hello. Questions already. I love this. Oh, we can't get Dr. Deb on, guys. Just give me one second and I might have to just rejoin. Just give me one second. I'll try again. Stay with us. If for some reason I can't get Dr. Deb on right now, I will be jumping straight. Back. Oh, here she is. Hello. How are you? Hi, how are you? <laughs> It said Dr. Deb's unable to join, and I thought, oh, yeah, that's a I first. Yeah, I don't know why your, oh. your, um, your request to me didn't come through, so there you go. I put one through. Oh, the, there, there you go. go. But we've got now. you now. That's the main thing. How drinking are you? My, drinking my warm tea on this chilly day. Oh, do you know what it's I literally just wear it. I'm in the studio, and we've got our office next door, and we have someone on our team is Chinese. We've got another one going through medical appointments at the moment for PCOS, and we just literally had the conversation on warm drinks. Yeah. And how it's so important to have warm, comforting drinks. So there you go. You're on the right track. <laughs> I love tea I've for got, children I've too. My, I've got my cold water. I need yeah. to go and warm it up. <laughs> how are you? Good. How are you doing, Emmy? Yeah, good. I was just saying to everyone that's on, there's so many people on already, which is fabulous. Um, and questions coming through. I was just saying it's a huge topic to unpack in such mm. a short amount of time. <laughs> But I feel like it's such a wonderful opportunity to obviously talk through, you know, these all important milestones, which I know for a lot of people is such a huge thing, especially for first time parents. I know that, um, you know, I, I felt a lot of pressure, actually, if I'm very honest, in those early days, I was in a mother's group and you hear all of these conversations around, you know, my kids speaking French at two and my kids doing this and my kids doing that. And you think, oh, my gosh, is there something wrong with my child if they're not meeting them? Um, but three babies down the line, I've certainly realise that they're all so very different. Um, but just how important it is to be aware, obviously, of what these look like across the ages and stages so we can best support our little ones. Exactly, yeah. So I wanted to start off with, you have um, contributed to an article we did recently, which I thought was a really good place to start because I feel like a lot of us at the end of the day, yes, we can talk about, you know, what they should be doing when and what those timeframes look like. But I think if we take a step back and have a look at all of these things, the social, the emotional, the physical and the cognitive development, that, you know, it's important to know how can we best support them, you know, whether it's emotionally or with their surroundings. Um, something that you did say in the article, and I'd love for you to share with everyone today, there's always the big question around nature versus nurture and how much of a difference this has. I mean, if our baby's born a certain way or is it the way that we're supporting them and their environment? Look, I think it's always a combination of both. Um, you know, not surprisingly, I guess, for those of us who have more than one child, I often marvel at how different, you know, our two children or three children are. And I think that, you know, in itself just illustrates, you know, the, the variety of what we can produce as, as, um, as a couple. But look, yeah. I think when it comes to development and who our children evolve into being, you know, they are born with certain genetic potentials, certain genetic traits and blueprints. 
Um, mm -hmm. But then there is so much that we can also do in order to help our children reach their full potential. And I often talk about that um, in my practice when I see children with disabilities or difficulties. You know, it does really become about how we can help each child to reach their full potential. Mm. Absolutely. And like I was saying, I think, yeah, my three are completely different. But having my third one who has a disability, I was able to flag that because I had, I guess, a mother's instinct and seeing what, what needed to be done. But I'd also had people around me like yourself and these wonderful group of experts to keep a check on things. And I think there's no harm in, you know, early intervention is obviously key in those situations. But also, yeah, just just being aware of what it looks like and, and how your baby is progressing within their own means. Mm. Um, now, you, you, you talk about, you know, brain connections and the way that these brains grow. And I've heard impressive stats in the past around those first five years. I, I think yeah. a lot of people underestimate actually, yeah, what, what that looks like in their first five years of life. Yeah. I mean, so you it, it is quite phenomenal. Yeah. yeah. I mean, when yeah. a baby is I'm born, so there's a little bit of a lag. So I apologize. If yeah. I'm, having yeah, I'm trouble not sure where the lag is coming from. Yeah. Um, you know, look, when a baby is born, they, they're born with their brains and they're born with their brain cells. But what hasn't fully developed yet are all those connections between the brains. And we're talking about millions and millions of connections. The, you know, the scientific word for that is synapses. And, you know, some people may have heard of this whole term of neuroplasticity. Um, and really, when it comes to developing brains, what that is about is, you know, to put it simply, the more that we use certain paths in our brains, the more those paths develop. Um, you know, versus, you know, pruning, which we also talk about where things that aren't used kind of just go away. Um, you know, and uh -huh. I think typically what you can see in children, you know, the way that I describe it is, you know, when a baby is born, if you look at their hand movement, for example, it's jerky, it's, it's erratic, it's not very specific, and it's not very smooth. Mm -hmm. And, and that um, action of, you know, th that, sorry, that development of, um, of going to that smooth action, you know, the, the, the fineness of it, the, you know, the, the intricacies that children then develop with their fine motor skills, that's through practice. And that's, you know, that's through repeating those motions and uh, then, mm -hmm. you know, solidifying those communications in the brain to, you know, then body parts and um, how children develop. And, um, you know, that, that's the same for, you know, for, for lots of the ways children develop, which is why, you know, we often talk about repetition Mm. and how important it is you know and another yeah. thing that just pops into my mind is it may seem very boring to us to read the same book to children again and again and again and again but actually it's a wonderful way for children yeah. to to learn to understand as well as to feel secure and understand routine and um you know so I'm, I'm kind of like throwing a whole lot of things in here in terms of you know how best we can support our children but you know just to highlight exactly how important those early years are in terms of what we do as families as well as the society for our children and i'm glad you've mentioned that repetition thing actually because i've come fresh out of speech therapy this morning with my daughter who has intensive speech therapy and that is exactly what we do. It is practicing the same target words over and over again until she masters them before we move on to the next thing. And I think as adults and, you know, as parents, we always want something new and exciting and we've got to get this book and we've got to do that. And we've got to, you know, and it's us that are always wanting something different when in fact our kids really do enjoy, like you say, having that same book over and over again or having that routine in place. So yeah, I, I'm definitely learning that more so now going yeah. through all of these therapy sessions myself, just how beneficial it is. Absolutely. And, and I guess they feel a sense of accomplishment once they, uh -huh. you know, reach that as well. Yes, yes. And I, sorry, I, I was just going to kind of carry on talking, but button if you want to, Emmy. But, you know, and I, I think if we take a little bit of a step back in terms of, you know, a framework that I often talk about for families to support their children. And this, you know, this is, can be applied to multiple things, but in terms of development, you know, when I talk about my five to thrive um, that yes. I've mentioned before with you, I talk about plate, play, pause people and protect you know it's, it's yeah. five easy p's to remember in terms of how to really help our children thrive and um when it comes to development you know when we talk about plate we're talking about nutrition and we can dive into all of these things if you'd like to um mm. play about what we're talking about now it's about allowing them to explore to repeat um what they're actually learning in order to master their skills um 
and again, I, I pause because I think of so many things I want to share and then I go, oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it gets too much. Um, you know, pause is about sleep. You know, we're talking about children doing so many things, but actually it's when they sleep that it cements those memories and it's so important. Mm -hmm. um, people it's around you know the environment in which your child is in it's about love i mean the fact that um a child has a nurturing relationship with their primary caregiver is so not just protective but it's, it's actually really promotes the development um and then lastly protect you know and here i'm not necessarily talking about wearing a helmet when they're riding their bicycle which is important but here I'm also talking about environmental um, elements that can certainly impact on our children, you know, toxins, lead, other things that they can be exposed to, mm. as well as my all important microbiome. But we probably won't dive into that one today. <laughs> <laughs> yes, well, no, but it's an important thing to mention as yeah. well. And I love that you mentioned actually each of those things because I did want to do that. I want to dive a little yeah. bit deeper into each of those because I feel like. Yeah, I mean, um, we hear this, but, you know, you're very practical with your recommendations and your knowledge. And I know that, first of all, you talk about plate um, and a wholesome diet. And in the article that you wrote, you know, you talk about all of these wonderful things that we can include in their diet, including the high DHA omega-3 fish oils and, you know, yeah. all sorts of other nutrients. Would you be able to just share a little bit more about, yeah, I mean, plate, how can we best support them, you know, and, for, and, and what age are we typically talking about? Look, I mean, you know, we talk about the first five years when it comes to um, development. You know, there's also the, the topic of the first thousand days, which is the, you know, from conception to two years mm. and then the first five years. But, you know, if, if we talk about nutrition, it starts really in utero, <laughs> you know, so it's what yeah. mums eat. And then it's what baby's being fed. Look, we all know that breast milk is best. Sometimes it's not possible or not the choice of a family. And, um, you know, then that's totally fine. Um, and then your next big choice comes into, well, what solids are we going to feed our child? And, and then, you know, what's going to be on their plate? And mm -hmm. as you've already mentioned, you know, I do have a couple of nutrients that I think are particularly important when it comes to learning and brain development. Um, yes, the, the um, fats, the, the healthy fats, the omega-3 fats. Um, I also do, you know, I definitely am a huge fan of high iron foods in children mm. um, because it definitely um, supports good learning. Iodine is another one, um, mm -hmm. seafood, um, just in case yes. you see know, something like that. Um, and the other big one I like is choline, which not very many people have heard of, and that yes. is most easily found in eggs. So, you know, I'm certainly not simplifying the foods and saying, oh, well, you only need these four foods and you <laughs> certainly need all the other nutrients i'm just flagging a couple of things to think of in terms of including in your child's diet to ensure that they have all the nutrients you know and and i guess then you go well you know because mom's going my goodness my child won't eat anything but pasta and peas <laughs> yeah, but why? You know, which, is, <laughs> which we can certainly do a live on as well fussy picky eating you know and yes. then i guess that's times when you start considering you know do you need a supplement do you need blood tests do you need to see your mm. pediatrician about this or a dietitian yeah, it's actually funny. I was away last weekend on a work trip with Jess, our senior editor, and she was giving her little one a supplement um, and she had realized she'd stopped and she said, he's starting to become more clingy and wants me to hold me and he's following. She goes, and I've realized that every time this happens is when I've dropped off on giving him the supplement. And she said, I can actually tell that he needs it. So, you know, I, it does have a huge impact. I've obviously got another daughter with ADHD and I know that her diet and, you know, when she spikes, it really is a result of what has been consumed. Yeah. And I think it can be overwhelming, like you say, as parents to make sure we're ticking all the boxes and feeding them all the right things. But having that idea, like you're saying, of what things we should be including will really help us form some kind of guideline across the week. Yes. More fish for my family. That's my goal. <laughs> but supplementation, I think, yeah, I feel like a lot of people, yeah, they kind of steer clear. So it's wonderful they have resources like yourself, you know, that really do take a look at the full picture and be able to give that as an option. Because let's face it, they, they do go through very fussy stages and it's not <laughs> always easy to, unless you force feed them. <laughs> Um, the other thing you talk about is the plenty of time for play. We touched a little bit on that, obviously, with talking about repetition and reading the books. But, you know, I remember, again, being a first-time mum, and I was like, oh, my gosh, you know, reading about my baby's eyesight. How far can they see? Should I be doing finger puppets? And should I be doing tummy time? And, you know, at what stage do you, you know, increase those activities? Um, can you share a little bit, I guess, about play and, and you know, again, like, is this important from birth? 
birth and how do we interact and best support our little ones across those first years? Look, I think um, it is a bit of a tricky one because you need it to be baby led in a way um, and support them yep. in terms of where they're at. And, and like you said, it certainly depends on what they're capable of doing. For example, um, you know, an 18 month old is not going to be interested in sharing their toys and that's totally <laughs> developmentally appropriate. Whereas you would expect them to be sharing and doing um, uh, turn taking by the time they're four or five, you know, so, so you have to take that into account, you know, but typically a lot of the initial play is dependent on the relationship with the primary caregiver. Mm -hmm. you know um, yeah. and that is it's, it's you know it's it's holding the rattle for your baby it's handing it to them it's it's seeing you know and then you know as a pediatrician we kind of tick through certain milestones um as as we go and, you know so a baby who's four months may hold a toy but by the time they're six months they should be transferring the toy you know and mm -hmm. and um, a baby you know who's six months can grasp for a toy you know like with their hand like that whereas a baby who's nine months should be able to pick up something teeny tiny like this to play with you uh -huh. know so it really does it really does depend on the age and stage which can be very overwhelming for parents which mm. is when it comes to the whole play group and um, you yes. know mixing with other um, similar aged babies which I think there's a good and a bad to it you know, the good mm. is, is that they flag something that's going, oh, actually, my baby's not doing that. The bad thing is, is that it may actually make you worry unnecessarily. Yes. Um, you know, so you, you've got to always look at it. I think it's, it shouldn't be your only point of reference. I think yeah. that you know, if, if you are mixing with other similar age children and you feel that your child isn't um, doing the same kind of things, then that's when you should be going to see your healthcare provider. Mm. You know, whether that's general practitioner or your pediatrician um you know there are also lots of resources out there i i, I do have a, a good free resource for parents that they can find on my instagram page if they just go to free resources it'll be on there um right otherwise they can just dm me and and i'll send them the link but you know i i think it is a good idea to have those certain milestones in at least you know whether you've put it up on the wall or you know some sort of a place to refer to to know like well you know, I've mentioned a few already. Um, you know, this is what they should be doing at this age, this age, and this age. Yes, but you're exactly. not expected to remember them all. <laughs> no, <laughs> that, exactly. that's my job. Which I'm going to give everyone a little bit of a hint. We may just be launching a tool in the app, which is going to help just to very easily track Wonderful. those things. So, so stay tuned on that. But um, again, I love that you say there's the good and bad with the whole mixing with mothers' groups or parents' groups or other kids, because I was that person that didn't want to join one. My husband said, Emmy, you have no friends with kids at the moment at the same age. You know, it's really important. And I'm so glad I did because it did allow me to, you know, be able to cross check or reference and, you know, not, and also for the child to be, you know, in that company as well as they grow older. Um, but again, if I could even refer back to my third child, you know, I could see she was more floppy in the high chair all the time. I could see that she wasn't babbling or using her sound. She sounded different. And, and it's not to scare anyone because I think, yeah, it can feel very overwhelming and you feel like, oh my gosh, there's something wrong. But I must say, I am so glad that I early, had early intervention, that I was able to flag those things, reach out to someone and say, I think that something's not quite right and then continue those investigations. And, you know, she's now nearly four um, and it's only just the last two months that we've had a, an official diagnosis with something else. So I think, you know, you should always trust your instinct and 100%. ask the question if you're not sure. Yeah, and if yes. you don't get the answer you want with one healthcare provider, just go to another one. Very true. Yeah, mm. exactly. If only you could reach more people, Dr. Deb. <laughs> You've got a bit of a fan club. <laughs> Anytime we post your content, we get so many people saying how much. But it's, yeah, just absolutely love your approach. Now, um, with the playtime, um, you then said time for rest. Now, yeah. sleep is huge. Like, yeah. yeah, for me and my family, I was very protective of my little one's sleep. Just how important it is, is it to their development? Oh, well, I think we all know ourselves, you know, how cranky we feel and how hard it is for us to concentrate you know, if we haven't had a good night's sleep, um, you know, hello, all new mums out there. <laughs> You're experiencing it now. <laughs> um, Actually, know, so... Tiffany on our team, sorry, can I just jump in because I know she's watching. She's just celebrating. a very... Since she was in her third trimester of pregnancy, she said it's the first time she's ever slept eight hours in a row last night with her daughter, who's nearly 18 months old. So we all just had a mini oh, celebration. Ouch. <laughs> <laughs> it's a long time. <laughs> Look, I, I think that... Um, 
look, I mean, we all know that sleep's important. And as I said, that's really when, you know, the, the memories are cemented in the brain and we know that. Um, it also then gives energy to, you know, to learn the next day and to explore, et cetera, et cetera. It also makes you emotionally open to it. You know, when, yeah. when you're tired, you feel sensitive and vulnerable and maybe children aren't so good at taking risks then. And, and um, healthy risk-taking is important for the, the learning process. You know, it's, it's like if you're scared to fall over, you're never going to walk. You're never going to learn how to walk. You know, it's, it's that theory. Um, you know, so, you know, it, you, the flip side of that is sometimes when babies go through developmental leaps, their sleep will actually get a bit unsettled. I don't know the answer as to why that happens, but it does seem to happen. If it's, mm. if it's prolonged, though, I do think you need to look a little bit deeper and explore well, why exactly aren't they sleeping properly. It can't just be from that. Yeah, exactly. And I've met quite a few people that have said to me, oh, you know, my baby doesn't need very much sleep. And I think, oh, gosh, like all babies need sleep. This is oh, when yeah. they're, like you were saying, these skills are forming and memories are being cemented. And, you know, it is it is so vital. And I think, like you say, they will go through these, you know, some people call them leaps or developmental changes or progressions. And, yeah, it's it's just learning different ways to support them. And I was just sharing with the team then, a lot of people have this misconception that once you fix your baby's sleep and they sleep through, that you You've done it. You're 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 on the right track. But then there's going to be something else that pops up. I know that my uh, seven year old is having nightmares this week, so we've been waking up at three a.m. So I, yeah. I feel like it's yeah, setting realistic expectations of what sleep does look like, and reaching out to people that can support you if you feel yeah. like for some reason they're not getting the right amount of sleep. Exactly. Um, with the uh, and routine, sorry, can we touch on routine a little yeah. bit as well? Do you think that this is where routine comes in? Do you think with you know sleep and sort of what that day looks like is that beneficial? Look, I'm a huge fan of routine. I think it makes children feel very secure, and I think when mm. children feel secure, they can then they can then expand. If that makes sense, um, yes. you know. So yes, routine and preparation. Obviously, age dependent for your child. Uh, when I say preparation, what I mean is informing your child what's coming next. I think that, okay. that, you know, especially if you have a child who tends to be a little bit on the anxious, fearful side, I think that can be very comforting for them. You know, in 30 minutes, mm -hmm. we're going to start getting dressed to go out, you know, or something simple like that. that that's, you know, the, the little example I'm giving. Um, mm -hmm. But certainly when it comes to sleep, there's been study after study literature, you know, it's this it's so strongly supportive of a very clear routine for your child, um, mm. you know, so that expectations are set and they know exactly what's coming next and what they know what their role in that is. And that is to fall mm. asleep. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. And I, and I think when it comes to routines, you know, have everyone on board as well. There's often not just yes. one parent who, um, who looks after a child or one family member, you know, have, mm. have everyone on the same page so that um, it makes things much easier, whether that's going to be written and put up on a wall somewhere or however you want to do it. Um, yes. You know, some, some parents out there are going to be going, ah, what does she know about? Like, it's, this is all nonsense. You know, and there's certainly some parents who like to just go with the flow. And, um, yeah. you know, and, and I think that that's fine as well if it suits them and their families. But, you know, what suits me and what suits a lot of my patients is that very clear structured routine. Oh, absolutely. Like I, I was, I went into to parenting thinking I was going to be a go with the flow mum because I'd reference my mum. I was an 80s baby. So yeah. things are very different these days. And then I quickly realized that the routine actually suited me because it really yeah. helped me know how that I'm giving them the right food and sleep and balance and structure. And yeah, and it just gives you an end point at the end of the day. But I like what you say about making sure everyone's on board because that is a big conversation you need to have with, you know, anyone else that is supporting you because when you're misaligned, it just throws everything out the window. Absolutely. Um, yeah, they're very good tips. And the warning, the 30 minutes before, I actually do, um, for my daughter, obviously, that has the ADHD, that's a big yeah. part of what we do. We actually started off drawing, you know, the morning routine and she got very excited ticking each thing off. I know that I was in Kmart the other day and they had these fabulous little morning and evening magnetic routines you could map out so you could, you know, help prepare your child for each of those stages as well. Lots of helpful tools out there. Now, you touched on um, before about relationships, and I would love to just um, quickly touch on that again about feeling safe and seen. You know, I feel like in those early days especially, a lot of us tend to feel like we're not giving enough or we're not doing enough because we're tired, we're cranky. Um, but, you know, obviously building a strong relationship with our little one is important. I mean, what does that look like? Is, is it... 
I don't know, like we talk about 10, like if you're a busy working mum like me, for example, I know that in that time that I've got with them before they go to bed, I need to put everything aside and that is my commitment to them. I need to be with them, be present, not distracted on my device. Like, it, yeah, how is it okay that we're not there 24 seven and absolutely gushing over our little ones? Look, I think it's about quality over quantity. And I think that yeah, it's, it's, that's one part of it. And I think the other aspect is that as, and I'll, t I'll talk as a mother as well, um, you know, I think we have to care for ourselves first, you know, that, that you talk about your cup being full before you can fill someone else's, um, you know, so I, I I do think it's important not to not to beat yourself up a lot. And I see a lot of a lot of mama guilt, I call it, and I go, don't feel guilty, you know, because yeah. it is a tough gig. And, um, you know, and I think it's a hard one. So I do think we have to support, you know, the the family as a whole. I don't think it's all just about giving, giving, giving to a child. I think it's about yes. supporting family as a unit. Um, you know, so they said, and you can catch yourself too. And like, you know, the one thing you've mentioned about phones and things like that, you know, so I think maybe, you know, a good tip that, that I could give is consciously deciding a particular thing that you're going to do. That's going to be to connect mm -hmm. to your child. Better. You know, whether that's, you know, device free time at dinner, which is, you know, I think is a great thing, whether that's, you know, pick up from the car is often a time, you know, where you're talking to your child. Yes, you're driving, but I mean, you're still, um, you know, talking to them and, and hearing what they have to say. You know, I, I do think it's about being conscious about what's going on, about your own abilities, you know, and I, it, it makes me very angry as a working mum because I do feel that that sometimes we're expected to, you know, you know the saying, you know, parent is if, as if we have no job and, and work as if we have no yeah. children, you know. So, yeah. and, and it's a very tough space to sit in. And I think just acknowledging that and, you know, having having supports around you, but but definitely you know, connecting with your child as best you can, as often as you can, I guess, you know, yes. is, is the best advice that I can give. Um, because a lot of time, especially children who are going through this temper tantrums and emotional dysregulation, you know, a lot of times it's just about being present with them, you know, yes. and, and, um, it can be, it comes at the worst times. Often it can be very frustrating. You know, maybe that's the time where you do, put your phone down, stop cooking, whatever it is, get down to their level, connect with them, and you'll be amazed at the impact that that can have. Absolutely. For me, it's always story time at night. I, each child gets a, their own story with me one-on-one -on -one in their room. It makes bedtime a little bit longer than I'd like it to be, but they look forward to it, and we do have that connection. Yeah. And, you know, it, it does look different over the different ages and stages as well. But I think, yeah, yeah. I, I, I think we're all guilty of being really hard on ourselves when it comes exactly. to those things. Um, I am conscious of time, so I'm going to jump to the next one. We said protection. So you say that this isn't just about putting a helmet on to protect our little one's brain. What do you mean by that? You know, what, one of the aspects of what I always look at is, you know, what can be potentially harming our children, you know, and when it comes to protect with development, um, I guess the most glaringly obvious thing is going to be around toxins for our children and whether those toxins are environmental you know the, the thankfully we don't have lead in our paints anymore but that certainly was an issue in the past um yeah. but also all the foods that they're eating all those preservatives all those additives all the colorings uh, you know the number of of parents that will say to me oh my goodness after a birthday party my children are just unmanageable, bouncing off the walls, won't listen to me, melting down, you know. And, mm. and in that state, no child is capable of, mm. you know, learning and growing and developing, and certainly not to the degree that they would if, if they were calm and, and receptive to it. So, you know, mm. the, the mainstay would, would be um, around avoiding the foods that, that perhaps are doing more harm than good. Yeah. Absolutely. I know even with my sons, he gets asthma sounding. The minute he has color, something with colouring in it, I can hear it straight away in his voice and it's not until you yeah. really pay attention that you realise the effect that it has. It's quite scary, actually, because there's a lot of hidden things, you know, things that you think are good. In fact, I'm actually doing another live on Thursday on this very topic around, yeah, how to navigate that supermarket aisle because it is so overwhelming. I know I still don't have any idea. I'm always having to reference as well. Um now, the other thing I wanted to talk on, obviously, is just uh, 
again, conscious of your time, Dr. Deb, because I know it is always very limited. Um, but when we look across, I guess, the babies, the toddlers and the preschoolers, now you mentioned earlier about, you know, grasping things, swatting things, passing from hand to hand. Are there some, this is a big question I know, are there some key things? <laughs> You're probably like, there's so many, just download the resource. Yeah. But is, this, is it more you know, the emotional or is it the fit? Like, yeah, what, what is that? What are these things that are truly very important that we need to be keeping an eye on that you would typically flag when someone comes in for an appointment? Well, it really is very much dependent on the age of the child. Um, you know, and I, I, the going through every single milestone is obviously not possible, which is why I did create no. the resource. Um, but is know, it so like a six-month check? Is it like a – like? Yeah, what, what do yeah. those – So I, I think, look, first of all, what we look at is we look at four elements. We look at gross motor, fine motor, um, social, as well as language. So those are the four um, areas that we look at when it comes to development. Gross yeah. motor is things like running and jumping, etc. You know, so and, – and what ages do we look at? So, again, their typical age is that uh, we will do a screen for certain developmental milestones, like a milestone check-off list. Mm. The first one is usually – around about that six to eight weeks. And then we go mm -hmm. three months, six months, 12 months, 18 months. You're getting a pattern here, right? To, yeah. You know, 24 months, two and a half years, three, four, five. You know, so it kind of staggers out as a child gets older. But typically speaking, we're talking about every six months that they should be attaining, you know, that, that, next, um, that next leap up. Mm. And um, there's always a variety. But yep. if you look at what the CDC said, so that, that's in the U.S. have um, done, they've, they've recently um, shifted their milestones a little bit to um, having, I guess, 75% of children by this age should have attained these certain milestones. Okay. You know, so, for example, by 18 months, a child should be walking independently, you know, mm. by, you know, by, by two years, they should be putting two words together and have 50 words, you know, so, you know, in terms of speech. So it very much depends on the age. Um, and, but those are the things that we look at, you know, how they're moving, what they're doing with their hands, are they feeding themselves? Um, are they talking and what their emotional relationships are like? Yeah. Are they, I know they always see if they're engaging with you and looking you in the eyes and have that exactly. you know, social yeah, interaction. Um, I think the biggest trigger for me was my daughter didn't put pressure on her legs when she stood up in her cot. She couldn't pull to stand. And I thought, okay. oh, this is a little bit different to what I know. And like you say, they're not walking by 18 months. I think these are all things that you go, okay, something's not yeah. right here. Now, yeah, so for a lot of people... stand and cruising should be about 12 months. Um, yeah, usually right. it's around about 10 months, but I'd certainly mm. be constantly about about 12 months. And they're by cruising, you know, they're walking along furniture. Yeah. Mm. But or even knowing that... Time to walk. Yeah, exactly. And yeah, when that's missing, it's kind of like, oh, red flag. But, but I think, what age um, did she sit at, Amy? Oh, you know you what? Remember? She was still very floppy because my other kids were able mm -hmm. to sit in a high chair by about, oh, I'd like to say, well, introducing solids four and a half, they were in a bouncer. And I think by five months or, yeah, but in between five and six months, the other two did. But she was like this. She was like slouched. Yeah, was like yeah so chair. sitting, exactly. So there you go. So sitting in a chair would be around with support about six months, whereas six sitting months. independently nine months. So, yeah. yeah. Where, where the, and, and never had that upright back. You know when kids are playing with toys and it's very cute, where, yeah, around the nine months where they, yeah. they're sitting there playing. You think, oh, how cute they're sitting there. We never had that. It was always very yeah, round and over and, and yeah. floppy. And I think, you know, you know, and, and like you say, because... I'm glad you mentioned those milestones because some people don't know. I still speak to people that don't realise how frequently they should go for checks or even where to go mm -hmm. because if it's your first baby, you've probably got a GP that, you know, that might not be suited for you and your family, your growing family. So um, it's about knowing, yeah, when to seek that advice and those check-ins. But, yeah, I'm so glad I kept pushing because I was told that she didn't have low muscle tone and it was okay and I just knew something you was knew. not right. Yeah. Yeah, I knew. So for those people that are first timers or maybe they're pregnant or they've just had a baby, yeah, if they're not happy with their current care provider, I mean, is a GP enough? Is it the GP that will be doing these regular checks? And at what point do people come and see yourself, you know, a paediatrician or someone like yourself? People are able to see a pediatrician whenever they want. Um, you know, they don't have to have something serious going on. I look after a lot of mm. babies essentially well. Um, yeah. But um, often the GP is your first port of call. And, you know, you've also got the blue book. I wish I should have actually brought one out. But, I mean, um, you know, the blue book. I always book forgot system... that. 
<laughs> yeah. I yeah. It's also got their questionnaires that you do in there. And a lot of them are, uh, you know, I text, are they doing this? Are they doing that? You know, you've got your early childhood centers that you can, um, you can link into your community centers and, mm. um, you know, but I, I think that, if you're at all concerned, first put a call out with usually say as a general practitioner, if you don't find that you're getting the answers that you feel comfortable with, then ask for a referral to a pediatrician. Yeah. And I guess it just gives you that little bit of extra detail and, and attention across, you know, things like developmental milestones. Because I know some GPs also are very busy and very rushed. And yeah. Yeah. I have a luxury of an hour with the patient. So... Yeah, exactly. It is different. And I just know first time around, I didn't quite understand the whole flow. I was in the hospital and then you're seeing a ped for a second. Then it's like, do I need to keep seeing that person? So it can yeah. be quite confusing unless you know, what, you know, what is your first point of contact? Um, and also too now with obviously, you know, a lot of things being online as well. Do you think that a lot of, you know, things might get missed, you know, if people are having yeah, a phone call? Yeah, you know what I'm also seeing? I'm also seeing quite a few, I guess, mild delays with speech around because of COVID. Mm -hmm. Is it um, masks and things, do you think? Like, or is it just more that... It's hard to speculate. I think it's, it's, it's less interaction. And that's the fact mm. that, um, unfortunately, families haven't been able to spend the time with their children, you know, during the day that they would like to. Um, yeah. Probably sounding a little bit confusing. But, you know, if a child's in daycare, they're being stimulated in certain ways. If a child's at mm. home and a parent has to work um, online, they're not able to stimulate them in those same ways. It's no fault of the parent. It's just the situation. Um, you know, yeah. so I'm certainly seeing that, um, you know, and sometimes children will need support. Sometimes they'll catch up quickly, you know, being back, you know, in preschool. Yeah. Well, the best thing I ever did was send my little one to daycare because, you know, people think, oh, she's got delays. Maybe it's too soon. I can tell mm. you, I, I, I believe that her growth yeah. and, you know, everything has come from there because there's no way I could give her the time and attention or the patience, let's face it, with doing those painting activities. <laughs> We're I also not, I mean, we're also not trained, you know, like don't be hard yeah. on yourself, you know. The, yeah. The people who are there looking after our children have been, have been trained, so yeah. Absolutely. No, definitely many benefits with that as well. Now, Dr. Deb, I am conscious we've gone over time with you today. Is there anything else <laughs> that I've missed asking you that you wanted to add on the topic of milestones? Or do we think we did a pretty no, solid job? No, I mean, look, I think we did as best we could, considering we can't go through every single one. I, I, you know, I just want to reiterate exactly what you said, that although there is a range, it's always important to trust your gut. And if you're worried, definitely get it looked into. Yeah, absolutely. You will never regret it. You will never regret asking for no, a second. No, no. And even if everything's normal, I mean, what a good feeling to walk away and good knowing, oh, well, that's all great. Exactly, exactly. Well, I will definitely share um, this live for those of you that might have joined us halfway through. I know a lot of people usually tune in and watch these afterwards. It's hard to find a time that suits everyone. Um, but I will share this video, obviously. And then Dr. Deb, you know, those links to your free resources, like you mentioned as well. Um, but again, always here if anyone ever has any questions. Lovely comments, Dr. Deb. Sure, Thanks so much. What a oh, very interesting and helpful. There you go, Dr. Deb. That is awesome Thank news. It's always so, great to chat. Lovely chatting. I look forward to catching up with you soon. And thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. Bye, everyone. Thank you. <laughs> Have a great Bye. day. Bye.